Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's ICENTD Connect webinar. I'm Marianne Comparet, and I'm speaking from the International Society for Neglected Tropical Diseases. Uh, we're based here in London. Um, today, it's my uh, very big pleasure to welcome uh, our colleague and friend, Dr. Cassandra Akinde. And Cassandra today will be speaking to us about some of her work and experiences in Nigeria with the NEO Child Initiative. Um, Cassandra is uh, very mindful of her broadband connection, which is why the video may come on and off. Um, uh, but however, Cassandra, I think you're right here with us. And uh, hello and welcome to you. How are you doing today? Hello, Maran. Can you hear me? Yeah, we can hear you very well. I'm fine. Thank you so much. Great. It's really lovely to have you here today. Um, just by way of introduction, uh, Cassandra is a young medical doctor. You trained in Lagos, Nigeria, um, and you um, then moved on and joined the Neo Child Initiative, uh, an NGO based in Nigeria. Uh, you joined as a team leader there. And as part of this, the work of this Fit. Uh, you've been really involved in building child health awareness and also uh, building their education and also um, really passing on messages to the, to the children that looking after their health is an essential and fundamental building block um, to a long and prosperous life and, the, and basically determining their success as future leaders. Um, so some fantastic work there. Uh, you've gone right into the communities to, uh, to do this. And we often hear about um, neglect of tropical diseases, the, the need for capacity building and also for grassroots, move, grassroots movements sorry, uh, to put in place and also share all the research uh, and the science and really pass that onto the community. So we are very excited to hear from you uh, today, Cassandra. Uh, also, you are a very busy woman. You are a Global Goodwill Ambassador for Health Advocacy in Nigeria. You're also, you've also received a Shevening Scholarship um, from the Foreign and Commonwealth Office here in the UK. And you're also a Student Ambassador and a friend at the Royal Society of Tropical Medicine and Hygiene. And you have an exam tomorrow uh, for your studies at the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine. So I'm not quite sure where, where you even find the time to sleep. Um, but uh, all of those things put together, we just wanted to thank you very much again for joining us today. And we look forward to hearing more about your work, Cassandra. So thank you. And uh, over to you now. Uh, we'll be hearing a little bit more about your work at the Neo Child Initiative. Thank you. So I just decided to quickly switch on my camera. <laughs> the network goes off because I just wanted to thank you. And camera for such amazing opportunity to be here and to be able to share some of my experience with the initiative and I also want to thank everyone who registered for this event. I really, really, really appreciate your support and we are going to enjoy this session uh, of mine. Thank you so much. So um, I would like to begin. So, um, as Marianne has told you, uh, my name is Dr. Cassandra Ikinde, and I'm a medical doctor. Um, I'm also, I also hold the Diploma of Tropical Medicine and Hygiene from London School of Hygiene and Medicine. I'm also I'm currently doing a postgraduate degree in London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine in Tropical Medicine and International Health. And I'm also a student ambassador for Royal Society of Tropical Medicine and Hygiene. And um, I'm the team lead for the New Child Initiative. And today I'm going to talk to you about investing in the future change makers, the Nigerian experience. So let's begin. So our theme is our today remains about their tomorrow. And that's because we believe children hold the key to the future. And every action we take determines tomorrow. I'm going to follow this outline. So case study, statement of the problem, about briefly about the New Child Initiative, changing the narrative through advocacy, research, and innovation, 
and we're going to talk about impact and of course i'm going to conclude uh, my presentation and then we can ask questions and any other feedback you'd like to give me so let's begin so this is uh, my case study so this is a seven-year-old boy his name is ola but it's not his real name and this is not his real picture just to take note of that so he 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 was actually playing football with his friends in an open field and that's when he sustained a poke in the foot in his left foot actually and like most nigerian children he he was afraid to tell his parents because he was thinking that his parents are going to beat him for that and therefore he told his grandmother instead and she advised him to uh, apply some herbal mixture on that wound and that's what he did and after a few weeks he actually developed symptoms of tetanus such as uh, difficulty in swallowing and stiffness of some of his muscles and then when that happened he now reported to his parents and then his mother took him to the nearest um, local pharmacy shop where he was given some antibiotic drugs because they thought it was malaria and then after he still kept being unwell, only then, then the parents took him to the hospital. But when he did get to the hospital, he died a most painful death. And just like Ola, millions of Nigerian children are actually on a thin level thread. And according to UNICEF, one in 10 Nigerian children die from mostly preventable causes before they reach the age of five. And even according to the World Bank report, Nigerian children are 20 times more likely to die between ages of 5 to 14 when compared to children in developed countries, for example, in the United Kingdom. And of course, Nigeria's childhood mortality statistics are currently very gruesome, and they are ranked the highest in Sub-Saharan Africa, and only second to India in the whole world. So the big question remains is, how then will they live up to their full potential? And that's the question that we need to ask ourselves. And I'm going to describe it to you. And this is where the idea began. In 2015, the Nigerian Child Initiative, now known as the Neo Child Initiative for Africa, was founded by Dr. Yosef Shitu in medical school. And I joined its founding. So Dr. Yusuf Shitu had this deep obsession with, with the notion that he can transform Nigeria by investing in his children since they hold the key to the future. And this he believed was achievable by helping them live up to their poten full potential by being healthy and have oriented minds. And since then, there has been no holding back for the organization. For the past five years, We've grown from a volunteer base of less than 10 people to over 500 volunteers across various Nigerian states and impacting lives of over 8,000 Nigerian children uh, via activities like medical outreaches, community and school awareness programs, training workshops, and mentorship programs as well. And therefore, our vision became in pursuit of a future where every child lives, a healthy, lives healthy and has the basic tools to change the world around them. And our mission was to transform the lives of Nigerian children by improving access to healthcare, mentorship, and self-development to achieve their full potential. So this picture depicts when it all began, and some of the founding members are seen here. So now, how have we been able or do all this how have we been able to change the narrative so how we've been able to do is that we've been improving access to healthcare, to primary health care services and also improving access to health education and this is how we began in 2017 with a campaign called ed Tentness. and this health awareness campaign was it was designed to increase the awareness of tetanus and how to prevent it and it began from social media, mass media, consistently disseminating health information across various channels. And then, of course, it now culminated actually in a community sensitization program where via community awareness health works, where over 2,000 people were actually sensitized about tetanus and what 
and how it can actually be prevented and then you found out about the symptoms and the importance of early treatment and prevention for this condition. And of course, during the, this uh, outreach, um, you, can, you can see here in the picture, here is me. I'm with, with the patient and um, we are actually conducting, I'm actually having a medical consultation, a free medical consultation with the patient. And apart from this kind of services, we also provided services like vaccination, of course, against tetanus, where 200 children were actually vaccinated against tetanus and um, we also provided uh, essential healthcare services like the warming exercises, nutritional assessment, malaria screening, dental uh, consultation and of course we provided them with essential drugs. So here you can also see some pictures. Uh, this is a child very happy, he just got vaccinated and he's promoting it here and these are some of our volunteers as well who took pictures with some of the beneficiaries from our program for tetanus. 2017. So we continued this with, in 2018, we continued this with another campaign that we um, designed and it's called Stop Pneumonia Vaccination Drive, which was also aimed to improve the pneumococcal vaccine uptake and of course also to improve the awareness of other preventable um, ways, methods, um, of stopping pneumonia, for example, like improving hand washing, improving um, sanitation, improving in nutrition, and of course, ensuring exclusive breastfeeding. And um, it also began with massive um, social media and ma mass media um, campaigns all over, and it culminated now in an outreach where, again, we provided essential healthcare services and we immunized, we actually vaccinated. Um, 70 children against pneumonia. So here you can see some pictures again of some of our beneficiaries. And here is um, one of my volunteers um, conducting malaria screening as well, of some of these children. So next is in 2019, we now conducted another massive awareness uh, campaign, health awareness campaign, which was called washed up and washed up means water sanitation and hygiene education against diarrhea undernutrition and pneumonia and this massive health awareness campaign involved school tracks so we actually went to about 50 schools with 100 volunteers going around schools and teaching children how to how to wash their hands properly according to the world health organization standard and of course providing them with um hand washing um uh, materials as well and as we did that we were able to establish some wash clubs in some of these schools and it actually uh, culminated now in in a uh, world record attempt for the largest hand washing lesson so i'm going to still show some pictures so and what's what what was interesting actually is that when we thought about this uh, campaign is that we, we actually plan to reduce the disease burden of undernutrition, you know, and other infectious diseases like diarrhea and pneumonia, of course, from our previous campaign. But what we also try to do was to mitigate disease outbreaks in our pandemics, which actually is very interesting because in a way we actually preempted, it, preempted this whole COVID-19 crisis as well, which of course we are still continuing doing. So, um, so that's so that's this. So you can see here, um, TNCI and natural care. This is the school track that we were conducting. So this is one of our volunteers again. She's teaching the child, and the child is very happy uh, demonstrating what she just learned about hand washing. And here is another child as well, very happy demonstrating what she was just taught. Now, in order to um, find more innovative and sustainable ways of um, continuing our impact. Um, near Child Care actually sprouted from the Near Child Initiative in 2019. And Near Child Care is, um, is an innovation, um, is a, actually an innovation social enterprise that offers dynamic solutions to um, bridge the gap 
of access to health care for children and their caregivers. And that's where the concept of mobile sick bay came by. So this is Jojolo. So it's uh, actually a Yoruba word. So it's a local language word in Nigeria for, um, for cradle. And this mobile sick bay, the concept of it is that we can provide all these essential health care services at once at a very reduced price for the children. So we are still making our impact and making, making, making sure that children in low-cost schools do have access to all these essential health care services. So, okay. So um, now, uh, also to maximize our impact, we actually uh, conducted some research uh, in order to highlight the burden and even recommend ways to improve our advocacy efforts. And of course, to also make evidence-based um, decisions that can actually be translated in the future into policy. And so this is just an example of some of, some of that. Um, this is a publication that we actually worked on. Uh, it's called The Missing Link in Preventing Tetanus Deaths in Children, a Nigerian case study. It was actually, it was actually, we were actually supposed to present this at Royal College of Pediatrics and Child Health Conference 2020, but uh, it has been on hold for now. But currently we're actually working on another research. And the title of the research is, Are Schools Prepared for Outbreaks? And we're going to assess the determinants of safe hand hygiene practices among school children. And that's going to be our case study in Lagos, Nigeria. So just as some pictures, again, depicting some of my volunteers working on some of this um, art of uh, research. So our impact. In the first five years, We've actually been able to conduct 11 outreaches and campaigns with a focus on malaria, diarrhea, tetanus, pneumonia, malnutrition, dental hygiene, and of course, deworming exercises. And we've been able to reach out to eight beneficiary communities. And over 8,000 children have actually been reached with essential healthcare services ranging from uh, nutritional assessments, malaria screening, uh, immunization, dental, free dental, medical consultations, and of course, provision of essential health care, essential uh, drugs. And of course, even health education. So here, for example, this is now the excerpt from our washed up um, campaign, where I talked about the global hand washing world record attempt where over 3,000 children were actually uh, taught, were taught how to wash their hands, and they were actually uh, demonstrating how to wash their hands. So it was actually, um, it was actually, okay, did I say 4,000, sorry, it's 4,000, it's 4, not 3,000, yeah. So, and you can see here the children all demonstrating how to wash their hands. <sighs> yeah. Okay, so. Moving on. Sorry, I think slide is not going. Oh, okay. So how have we been able to achieve all this? Well, first and foremost, we always have to say we have to be always grateful to our advisory committee who always helps us in achieving some of our goals and um, for instance this uh, campaign badge was made for one of our committee members dr jules uh, usually we crowdfund so how we get our source of funding is actually by crowdfunding and getting don material donations from corporates and government organizations and this is just an example where Dr. Jules actually um, gave us a certain amount of money and then we created a campaign badge for her and it was all over social media. And then of course that actually preempted some people to also donate to our cause. And um, so far that's how it has been so far. 
and this was for stop pneumonia. So, and now in terms of our volunteers, well, I just can say that volunteers are actually our network, and we rely deeply on the passion and dedication of our volunteers to achieve all our goals because actually they are our superheroes, and without them, we will not be able to reach out to all these children in underserved communities. And the fact that they invest their time, their energy, their skills, their sweat, their money into achieving our goals, they're really making a difference. Now, in terms of our partners, uh, we've actually had very successful, in the past five years, we actually have a successful partnerships. For example, World Connect, um, we actually received a grant for Stop Pneumonia and uh, it provided us with lots of logistics and lots of uh, resources for that particular outreach. So there is also Leap Africa, another um, partner that we have already built very, we've built a sustainable relationship with. Then we have Linking Hands Foundation, we have Reiki Banky, sir, and this, this uh, particular um, organizations, they've helped us um, with resources like, for example, hygiene parks. They donated uh, almost uh, about 300 hygiene parks during our Stop Pneumonia outreach. It was very nice. Uh, Shalina Healthcare, so it's a pharmaceutical company. And so far, they've actually helped us with uh, donating some deworming drugs, like, for example, Abendazole. So uh, for, our, for most of our health outreaches, where we do, where we conduct deworming exercises for the children, for the school age. And of course, we have we have a very good relationship with the local government, especially the local government, where we actually have conducted several outreaches in the community. And also we have a very good relationship and partnership with the Department of Community Health and Primary Care. Um, that's actually part of the University of Lagos where I schooled. And they've actually been amazing helping us with community mobilization and, of course, having a good relationship with the community leaders during our sensitization programs and health awareness works. So all in all, we do, we do value our partners, our volunteers, and this is how we've been able to achieve what we've been able to achieve for the past five years. And so I would just like to really acknowledge our superheroes because without them, this wouldn't have been possible. And so this is the founding team members. Some of their names are here. The advice support, like I mentioned, all of them have really, really, really been a good support for all of us, mentors for all of us, and given us all the support we need to continue this journey of advocacy. And these are some of the core members. <laughs> um, Pardon me for this misalignment of some names, but these are all the core members that for the past five years, so, so all, these are all the volunteers that for the past five years have really invested their time, their skills and their energy into our organization. And we do appreciate everything that they've done so far for us and for, in, in, for the children. So I would just like to say that in conclusion, um, Investing in future change makers by improving their health outcomes cannot be overemphasized, especially in a country like Nigeria. And to, to achieve this, it really requires deep-rooted advocacy, innovation, and of course it must be data-driven in order to bridge the access gap. And the journey may be long, but each day we take a step forward. And investing in our today, remains about their tomorrow. And as you can see here, this is the child. This is the smile of a child after we've um, had actually uh, conducted a, um, we gave a health talk and she was just so happy learning everything we taught her. And this is the smiles that we actually live for. Smile of it, beautiful child. So, um, I would just like to say thank you for your time. This is, um, so this is our logo. So this is our website. And this, I guess, is not really shown very well. This is our email.
So if someone wants to reach out, and these are some of our social media handles on Twitter, on Instagram, and on LinkedIn. So um, I'd just like to say thank you very much again. Thank you, um, Kamran. Thank you, Marianne, for this opportunity. I really appreciate this. Thank you. Well, Cassandra, thank you, actually. A, a, a lot of gratitude from ourselves and also from our attendees with lots of comments here uh, from everybody saying what a brilliant presentation this has been. Um, and certainly not just in terms of the acute work we've been doing in the communities, but also um, all of the community engagement, the very creative uh, means and uh, assets that you've uh, put together to share messages in those communities and with those children and on top of it also launching your own research so kind of all those things um, together really uh, made for a uh, fantastic presentation and what an exciting project uh, to get involved in and hear about so a massive thank you to you Cassandra and also thank you very much Dr. Shitu. Dr. Shitu has joined us and uh, Dr. you are the founder of the Neo Child Initiative. So Cassandra your work has given us a lot of food for thought and you've many many questions here and comments um, if you've got a chance to go over to the chat you'll see lots of people are really excited about what you've uh, told us about and so um, perhaps just to start off here um, a couple questions about the uh, actual way in which the Neo Child Initiative works um, so we've got a question here from Franklin Ayisi who was just wondering what are the criteria for the selection of the beneficiary schools and communities and perhaps a little bit related to that a question from Anne Wogu um, where is your research done in Nigeria okay yeah so uh, thank you so much Franklin um, Ayisi yeah so the criteria for selection of beneficiary schools and communities well actually um we usually what we try to do is we try to conduct a need assessment and so far from the communities we've been able to to reach out to uh, usually the communities that we have um, relationship with for example in terms of the local government like i explained there's this uh the, I, I showed the logo of Mushin local government area so it's actually in lagos nigeria and we actually have a good relationship with them and so because we already have a good relationship with them where it's it's easy for us to be able to do the community entry and be able to actually engage with the community leaders and because of that we try to really look at those kind of careers however we are still expanding to more so that's what i think i i think i i i heard you ask a question about okay no i didn't hear i saw it here just now about other states in nigeria so yeah definitely we're still we're still, uh, going to be expanding more and more and more but for now we actually look at where we do have relationships with the local governments and we still are going to create more and more and more relationships with them more and more sustainable relationships with them a question by stephen bramer which is um how is your health initiative linked to local regional and national health systems in nigeria um and also you had quite a few people including uh, emmanuel agunoye who's asking um, how could other children related ngos in ondo state collaborate with your initiatives in ondo okay well yes we, are, we like i said we're actually open to partnership as much as that's the reason why we always try to like uh be out there because what we want to do is create more and more and more partnerships and for on those states we actually like i said we're right now so far we've actually been based in lagos nigeria but we are looking at other states and therefore if we want to partner with you there are various ways we can actually partner so it's something that we are still looking into but do let us know do send us an email and we will definitely uh, come up with something because we do want to expand our reach within every state in Nigeria, the northern, the southern region, um, eastern region. Uh, for sure. And I think that's very clear from your presentation that this project right from the outset has been extremely partnership driven and very open to um, working in tandem and collaboration with lots of other organizations. So uh, with that, that point has been 
heard loud and clear and please to all our attendees don't hesitate to get in touch with cassandra you've seen the um uh, the contact details on the presentation and perhaps we'll flash those up again towards the end of our session um just a couple questions here cassandra about the actual yeah. research i think you did touch on that but um we've had a question here uh, asking whether the ongoing is the ongoing research answering two separate questions or was there just one question about whether the schools are prepared for outbreaks okay is the ongoing research answering questions or just one question if schools are prepared for outbreaks the, uh, the 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 research is actually related to the 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 research questions are actually related to each other because what we want to find out is what are the determinants of what are what are the hand washing practices like in these schools and then of course depending on what we find then we'll be able to match up with the different other criteria for other school uh, preparedness programs in other countries and see if this particular school is actually prepared for outbreaks based on the criteria that we find during our uh, review, literature review. Brilliant. Um, just a quick question here. Uh, based on your experience uh, from, from running these programs, uh, a question from Nicole Christine Kerkhoven from the Oswald Cruz Foundation, Theo Cruz. Uh, she would like to know if there is any difficulties of population's acceptance to, uh, in terms of uptake of a vaccine. And she's asking that because of the increasing anti-vax movement. And what were your thoughts or your experience on that, Cassandra? Yeah, of course. Um, I think vaccine hesitancy is actually very deep in great concept in some cultures in Nigeria, for example. And I know that so far it has sometimes has been actually difficult. Like whenever we go into the community, we do, of course, we always, you know, ask for consent from the care pro care provider, and um, we do we do give them choice. It's not it's not you know it's not like it's compulsory. You know that you are going to get vaccinated in whether you like it or not. But we do try to understand the reasons why. So what we do is we conduct, um, so I, I forgot to mention that we also conduct qualitative studies. So we do focus group discussions with some of these uh, community members, you know, and then we try to find out exactly what are their reasons and try to now respond to each of, each of their concerns. So definitely there are difficulties in that regard. But like I said, what we've been able to do is conduct these focus group discussions, find out the exact reasons and then respond to them accordingly. And of course, if after that, still people don't want, in that particular community, people still don't want to take that vaccination, then we now try to engage the community leaders, you know, because the community leaders do hold a great power in the community. And, and of course, if we can really show that their own children are getting immunized, then the community members will follow the example. Um, and Frank? AEC was asking here on a practical level, um, do you use the same volunteers in each outreach campaign or do you have to recruit new volunteers? Yeah, so of course every every year we actually recruit more and more. Like I said, right now we actually have over 400 volunteers on our database. And every year we actually recruit, uh, on, 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 uh, we actually recruit twice a year. So that's banal basis. So, and of course, you know, volunteers come, they move on sometimes to other, other, you know, they have other priorities in life as well, but we always make sure that we give them the best, you know, in terms of their personal development and growth. And then the other new volunteers, like fresh volunteers that come to us and we also help them develop, you know, and they also develop their skills. And of course, they also invest all the skills in promoting our organizational goals. So yeah, every year we do recruit. Brilliant. Um, it's quite I have another question here from Helena Uliartha. Uh, how has this initiative affected to reduce the prevalence of infectious diseases such as soil transmitted helminths, um, malaria, diarrhea, etc.? So, uh, how are you measuring your impact, and also uh, what what sort of um, success have you seen? Well. We've actually been working on our impact analysis report to show all this data because we are trying to actually, so like I said, this is our fifth year. So we're actually collating all our data into a five year 
um, impact analysis report. So everything will be shown in that uh, report. So definitely it's something that we really definitely want to show the prevalence and everything we've been able to do to achieve, especially in terms of the infectious diseases that she mentioned. Yeah. Absolutely. Um, okay, well, we, we will uh, head to, to that impact report. I'm sure there's a lot of detail contained there. Yeah. And the impact uh, analysis report will be very concise. Okay. <laughs> well, I'm learning from London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine. Brilliant. And uh, kind of expanding on the um, on the partnerships there and perhaps future collaborations, Ali Halajian was asking, are veterinarians involved in your project? Uh, it could be a great One Health project. Yes, um, thank you, Ali Halajian. I've, I've actually been like, I've been actually thinking about it because One Health is a very important um, or help what's more i so the other things actually that i didn't mention in the presentation is that apart from child health we also we also um looking at development education via sdgs the sustainable development goals and of course we look at everything we look at environment you know and we do want to get people from different walks of life to be able to help us achieve this course. So definitely One Health is something I would definitely still add, just like planetary health as well, in terms of climate change as well, yeah. Brilliant. Um, and kind of again, looking at the, um, looking at the expansion wait, wait, of the- Sorry, the sorry, sorry. I just, sorry, sorry, Maria. I just um, realized that, uh, I think maybe people don't realize that in our, in our, in our organization it's not just doctors i know i i showed a slide where there are lots of doctors but it's not that they are just medical doctors we have we have volunteers from different walks of life so it's not just medical doctors we have okay so we have healthcare workers we have people from um, a business related field we have lawyers we have accountants we have different so definitely everybody is welcome not just veterinarians everybody Fantastic. And so building on that, uh, Francis Sinagure Tolaki, hi, hi Francis, was asking, um, just wondering, how could we cascade this work and the, the, these findings into such systems in Africa? So how could you um, perhaps expand this across a wider region? Is this something you've given thought to already or not yet, perhaps? Yeah, definitely we want to scale it up. It's something that we've been looking at. And like I said, that's why we are looking at partnerships from other countries as well, you know, like African countries where we can actually expand what we've already started and scale it up and scale it up. Yeah, especially in, in terms of um, your childcare as well, the social enterprise, the mobile safety model. Definitely, uh, we'll be watching this space then. <laughs> what um, I just I mentioned it. Uh, just taking a little moment here to mention that if Cassandra doesn't have her video on, it's because her, uh, I, as I said, her broadband signal is up and down. Uh, but perhaps towards the end, Cassandra, you'll be able to give a little wave to all our attendees and uh, all these people who are extremely engaged with all your work. But um, I just thought I'd clarify that. Let me, let me try um, because I, I, I hear you, but it's actually delaying. And let me just see if I can. Okay. Oh, nice to see you. <laughs> Hopefully, tonight. Hopefully, yeah, fingers crossed. Well, let's not uh, jeopardize the connection by all means, but, you know, just to remind everyone tuning in, uh, we, we've tried our best, given that we're all locked in our homes, uh, working with our resources of home life and so forth. So I do hope you will forgive us for some of the technical ups and downs that um, we might encounter along the way. Uh, but lovely to see you, Cassandra. Um, here we had, we had a little question. You've got a few more minutes uh, to, to take some questions. Um, a question here from Derek Robinson, who was asking, um, Derek's got first-hand experience of traditional herbal medicine. Uh, sometimes it works, but most of the time it's dangerous or inefficient. What is being done to stop people using these types of self-medications? And is that something you've encountered in your own work? Yeah, so the thing I've 
um, self-medication and you know use of herbal um, mixtures has been actually very difficult to address sometimes because you know it still goes back to the fact that we have to engage the community members the, the, the people you know we have to really engage them and and the reasons why they do what they do you know and be able to exactly educate them about the the uh the uh the harmful effects of some of these herbal concussions herbal mixtures that they take you know so yeah it actually has been quite difficult because i know lots of people like when i talk about the case study about the grandmother um telling um the child to apply herbal mixture it's actually something that happens a lot like lots of people do that but like i said again it still goes back to the fact that they still need they still need for more education and also like maybe behavioral modification as well you know because people need to understand that this these things are dangerous, you know? One thing is to know it, but one thing is to do it. So that's what, that's where behavior also does behavioral modification, the, the way you can now ingrain those, those, that thought into the person is very important. So there's still a lot of work to that regard. And I'm sure there are a lot of organizations that are going to address that. But I personally too have been at that and it's something that I'm so very interested in. Uh, one question from John Gibb. Uh, so is this project additional to the federal government of Nigeria's efforts and how does it fit in with local government and state services? Oh no, it's not a federal government uh, project at all. Like I said, it's just something that uh, a young medical student thought of. You know, he wanted to make a change in his community as Dr. Isoshito and he did and he had people that shared his vision and then we started this nonprofit organization and now it is now moving towards this now we have a social enterprise arm of it you know so it was, also we are still expanding and we, that's why i said that we are still looking for partnerships so that of course we can partner with the federal government of nigeria with lagos state uh with the state with the ministry of health as well and you know other 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 uh, uh Aspect. It would be very nice, but it's not. It's not a federal. It's not a, a government related project. It might grow into something. Uh, Definitely. <laughs> hopefully, yeah. Yeah. Um, of course, we can't uh, talk about any community programs without mentioning COVID nineteen at the moment. So, Opeyemi Olasun Kanmi was asking, how has the COVID nineteen pandemic affected your outreach and intervention? Uh, intervention. <sighs> sorry, has there been a shift in public acceptance? Yes, COVID nineteen has really affected our programs because we 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 had lots of plans in um in march in april and all of these plans have actually had to be stalled because of the pandemic because most of our most of our projects are actually field based so we have to be on the field to do them you know but thankfully before the covid 19 uh really really um got its uh, peak we actually did uh, a follow-up on um wash top in some of those schools, we actually went to find out the impact of, to assess the, um, to actually evaluate what we did last year, you know, when we did the World Academic Record and when we went to all those schools to find out if their practices have actually changed, like a, like a post um, intervention survey, because we did like a pre intervention survey before we started, and then now, now we did a post intervention survey to find out. If there's any difference in their attitude towards hand washing so but yeah it's 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 been quite actually actually been quite um saddening that you know we've not be able to proceed with some of our projects but however we are looking at some other things we can be doing and for now we're looking at we've been looking at virtual platforms you know trying to get but of course it's very difficult to still reach our target audience which are the children for example, we actually wanted to do uh, a school first aid program where we teach children how to uh, how to uh, like basically how to um, act. You know, have basic knowledge of first aid because I I feel it's very very important. But 
that hasn't happened, of course, because of the pandemic. So what we are looking at is looking at a virtual platform of making it happen and at least be able to educate the, mm -hmm. their caregivers and their parents, you know, because there are various hazards that can occur at home while some of us are self-isolating and how we can actually curtail it and what to do when that happens. You know, everyone knows, everyone must know first aid. Absolutely. And as you say, one door closes, but then another one opens to um, perhaps uh, launch some new resources and different kinds of programs. Um, I think we've got time for basically one last question. And this perhaps may draw on your experience as the medical doctor and also what you've seen in the field. But a very interesting point here raised by uh, Lanre Ilela Kinwa. Thank you for your comments. Uh, back in developing nations, there are some stigmas attached to NTDs, that absolutely. And how can these be reduced? Yes, that's, that's a very good question. You know, that's why I'm so grateful to SNTD for, you know, for this platform, because it, it was actually through this platform I started looking at um, various possibilities of how you can reduce stigma, how you can use other ways uh, of how, how else you can actually drive some of these messages into people, you know, apart from normal health education, you can actually be able to use entertainment, you know, to, to make people realize that when someone does have this condition, it's not something to be uh, afraid of, you know, or something to be ashamed of, you know. So definitely stigma is something that is still, especially for neglected tropical diseases, like for example, leprosy, you know, people are still very much afraid of that. But I think there are various outlets that we can use to, to, to be able to actually reduce the stigma. We should ma make sure that we maximize all these outlets, you know. Use other fields, arts, for example, you know, or entertainment, like what I saw at the last um, ISNTD festival. So you definitely, or cloud, a cloud, a cloud, um, Nine media as well, you know, they've been doing lots of lots of um, documentaries, you know, about onchocerciasis and other neglected tropical diseases. So I think those are the kind of things that we need to be seeing, you know, seeing of how these diseases are and what someone can do and the fact that nobody should be ostracized or, you know, removed from the community just because this particular person has that disease. Absolutely. And instead, the community should actually support these vulnerable people and give all the care they can. Absolutely, and uh, that's something that's certainly very close to our hearts here at ICNTD. Um, I think what Cassandra was referring to was uh, an annual event that we put on. It's called the ICNTD Festival, and this is a um, an opportunity to bring together a lot of approaches in health communication, uh, but also, you know, awareness, education, stigma alleviation. It's called the ISNTD Festival, and it brings together film, apps, photo, um, games, all sorts of creative approaches to health messaging. So um, this is where we met Cassandra. Cassandra was part of our, I volunteered and was part of our ISNTD press corps, and uh, I was Delighted to meet you and uh, to keep you as a friend and colleague and everything. <laughs> it was only two months ago, but it felt like a different lifetime, right? <laughs> and in the meantime, Cassandra, I, I think uh, we're very grateful. You do have an exam tomorrow. You probably have still a bit of revision to do. <laughs> but, um, if possible, you know, probably let you get on with that. But we'd like to just say a massive thank you to you for your time today. I think you've elicited a huge amount of interest, certainly from what we can see on the chat from our attendees, you'll be getting a lot of collaboration opportunities. Um, I just, before we leave, wanted to read a really lovely comment by Emmanuel Adam Laurier. Um, this is very, extremely kind of you to write, Emmanuel, uh, who writes, I'm sincerely grateful to the organizers of this twice a week webinar. What you're doing to bring knowledge to us at no cost is unquantifiable. You break down barriers of knowledge because of accessibility and finance. Once more, we are grateful and please sustain it beyond the lockdown period, even if we need to shift the timing to evenings um, after official hours. Uh, Emmanuel, that's exactly what we wanted to do. 
when we started this out and so we're more than happy to carry on and actually it is us who are incredibly grateful to everyone who tunes in weekly um it's been an absolute pleasure i've enjoyed every single webinar every single connect and it's been really lovely to uh, make a lot of new friends actually um, in this bad situation have something good come out of it so a very big thank you to everyone for to participation but also for your support throughout the the nine weeks since the connect started and we will definitely carry on and if anybody wants to speak or participate please get in touch we're always looking for ideas and um you know maybe next time you can be the star of the show so send in your uh, proposals anytime to the i sent you the email um so on that note cassandra i was wondering you had any final thoughts or, or comments about today's sessions, perhaps what you'd love to see as next steps with the Neo Child Initiative? Well, I, <laughs> what can I say? Definitely, I'm grateful for this platform you've given me to be able to at least share some of my work with TNCI. And I know that definitely uh, produce more fruits from this. I'll just like to just say thank you again, Marianne, and thank you, Kamran, for, for this opportunity, you know, and I hope that maybe in the future we can collaborate with ISNTD, you know, <laughs> and see what else we can come up with. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, definitely. And I am thinking of various ways, you know, like, for example, doing collaborations with Acting for Health and other, um, other organizations, you know, to really where crap put the message across the health messaging that we are trying to portray. So definitely. So like I said, you everything you, you the platform is amazing. I'm very grateful and I do hope we can continue like this, you know, to 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 create more um uh, awareness about this platform so that more and more people will actually join because neglected tropical diseases are affecting more than one billion people and we need to be able to address them. You know, right now in this whole COVID-19 crisis, we are forgetting about NTDs and there are so many things that are going to happen if we don't start foot down, start to make some action towards it. So yeah, don't That's neglect it. Well, <laughs> <That's no. laughs> wise words, wise final words. Um, and we wish you all the best in the meantime with all the ongoing projects uh, at the Neo Child Initiative. Uh, I sent you DConnect will be here to chart your every success and your every milestone. So hopefully we will absolutely keep in touch and we'll hear back from you very soon, Cassandra. And until then, uh, don't forget to tune in next week. So Tuesday will be um, Stephen Maud from Cloud9 Media looking at the role of film and documentaries in health communication and health uh, documenting. And also on Thursday, which will be uh, May the 28th, we are welcoming Dr. Mark Sherlock from Médecins Sans Frontières, Doctors Without Borders, who will be talking about the very neglected disease Noma. Uh, which again uh, has uh, quite a high incidence in uh, Nigeria. So two really important and uh, fascinating talks for next week as well. And until then, I wish you all um, to have a great end of week, have a good weekend and keep very safe, look after each other. And Cassandra, again, a very massive thank you from myself and no doubt from all the attendees on the, on the chat um, also saying thank you. Thank you so much. Like I said, I really appreciate this. Stay safe. Stay safe. See you soon. And thank you again. Bye-bye, everyone. Bye. Bye.